Live from the BDN Studios, it's Bang and Dang. That's awesome. If you don't like that, then you ain't black. Welcome back to Battles of the American Civil War. And this is going to be a very, 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 very short episode. I'm willing to bet it's probably only going to be about 15 minutes, but it's all we can do as we have the last three battles before the next episode, which is the Battle of Gettysburg. And that's going to make up for it because it's going to be about an hour and a half for that one. Um, we have two battles taking place on the day of Gettysburg starting, so a lot of action happening here, including um, Mr. Jeb Stewart still trying to <laughs> run around uh, r- around Virginia and trying to look for Lee's army. So shit is about to explode over here. We got <sighs> Vicksburg taking its end and Gettysburg coming up here. <laughs> Union on fire. We got the Battle of Sporting Hill. Actually, as a skirmish at Sporting Hill, a skirmish at Car Isle, and then the Battle of First Cabin Creek. And all of these are literally like two paragraphs, three paragraphs. So, mm. not going to take a very long episode here. So, we'll get right into her. Probably could have, I don't know, the last episode was 35 minutes. Could have just put them in together, I guess. But, yeah. whatever. Uh, skirmish. Sporting Hill was a rel- it was a relative relatively small skirmish during the Gettysburg campaign, taking place June thirtieth, eighteen sixty three, at various locations, which is in present day Camp Hill, East Pennsboro Township, and then Hampton Township in Cumberland County, Pennsylvania. It is known as the northernmost engagement of Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia during the war. Really? All right. Confederate Lieutenant General Richard Ewell had led two full divisions and a cavalry brigade through Maryland into Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania in late June 1863 with the intention of seizing the state capital of Harrisburg. Mechanicsburg. They couldn't think of a, a better name than Mechanicsburg. What was a mechanic? I'm sure. Back in uh, the 1800s. Fixing the wheels on the wagons. Oh, yes. And, uh, when a blacksmith do that? Sure. All right. What would a mechanic be? All right. Mm. However, however... Ewell had been significantly delayed in crossing the rain-swollen Potomac River, which allowed time for the Union to respond. Pausing another day at Chambersburg, Ewell finally marched northwards through the Cumberland Valley towards Harrisburg. He's like, let's go. Why does everything end in a burg, Pennsylvania? Right. Pennsylvania's weird. In response, Union Major General Darius N. Couch, commanding the Department of Susquehanna, he dispatched troops to the present-day borough of Camp Hill, if you guys know where that's at. Located in Cumberland Valley, approximately two miles west of Harrisburg. So all you Harrisburg folks out there. Laborers hired by a couch quickly erected earthworks and fortifications along the western portion of Bridgeport. Adjacent to Camp Hill. Bridgeportburg. And that'd be weird, huh? Bridgeburgport? <laughs> Berg, Bridgeburg, Port, <laughs> Berg. Uh, this is the two largest of these became... Known as Fort Couch and Fort Washington. Ewell's Cavalry, a brigade under the <laughs> brigade under the command of Brigadier General Albert Jenkins, raided nearby Mechanicsburg on June 28th. That same evening, receiving the unexpected news that the Federal Army of the Potomac was rapidly advancing through Maryland, Robert E. Lee was forced to consolidate his Army of Northern Virginia towards Gettysburg, right. Gettysburg to counter this new threat. Had to. As a result, Ewell began to withdraw and would never realize the objective of taking Harrisburg. Oh. So he's like, well, can't take it now. Well, Jank, Jank. You think they knew? Who? Like Yule? No, like Lee and the Confederates knew that Gettysburg was going to be so huge. I mean, you got uh, yeah, two once, eighty thousand uh, armies. So it's just fucking about to just go at it, dude. Once Lee found out, he was like, "Oh man, this can be a monster." Mm-hmm. It's in the movie Gettysburg. Check it out. <laughs> Jenkins briefly skirmished with the 22nd and 37th New York Militia at Sporting Hill on the west side of Camp Hill on the 29th of June, 1863. The Confederates used the barn of Johannes Elberly House, also known as the McCormick House. They used that as cover while engaging the Union soldiers' position along the Carlisle Pike. The Confederates attempted to cross the Carlisle Pike and outflank the Union soldiers, but the Federals saw their maneuver and stimmied their efforts. The Confederate soldiers began artillery fire upon the Union position, which shot and shell around about 5 p.m. Just then, at that very moment, Lieutenant Perkins of the Federal Army arrived with two cannons and began firing upon the Eberly House. 
uh, the barn. No, you already know once those cans gained, they're like, oh, shit. Mm -hmm. Well, the Federals' very first shot at the barn smashed through the upper wooden structure and sent approximately 50 Confederate soldiers running outside to their horses. I bet. The Confederates withdrew in the direction of Carlisle to rejoin Ewell's infantry for the march southwards towards Heidlersburg and Gettysburg. At least 16 Confederates from the 16th and 36th Virginia Cavalry were killed during the fight, and an additional 20 to 30 were wounded. Union losses were only about 11 men wounded. Jeez. Good for them, huh? Wow. Well, some of this very bad field was lost to development and the construction of Pennsylvania Route 581. A Pennsylvania Historical Museum Commission historical marker uh, denote, denoting the skirmish exists at the intersection of 31st Street and Market Streets in Camp Hill. Hmm. I bet there's a picture of that somewhere. The wooden part of the Eberly Barn, where the Confederate soldiers were positioned, was destroyed by a tornado on the 21st of March, 1976. But the barn's limestone foundation still remains. Both the Eberly Barn Foundation and the Eberly House itself are still standing. Good for them. Oh, the house, too? Nice. They, uh, they are preserved by real estate developer Tom Gowan, who built the nearby Brambles apartment complex that encircles the house. Oh, shit. It's right in the middle. There it is. Ah, uh, which leads us to another little skirmish, which is the Battle of Car Isle, which we just heard about um, on the same day as Gettysburg. So... <sighs> Jeez. Uh, after Carlisle was settled in nineteen or 1751, the Carlisle Barracks Military Post was established nearby in 1757 and had an antebellum United States Army Cavalry School. By June of 1863, the Barracks Cavalry had been withdrawn to Harrisburg. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, 27th of June, 1863, Confederate Lieutenant General Richard Ewell's Second Corps of the Army of Northern Virginia. Damn. Uh, it stopped at Carlisle en route to Harrisburg. And gather supplies, forage, and uh, find some food from the populace. He will, as well as some of his own. <laughs> <laughs> I could preach <laughs> You, as well as some of his officers, had been stationed at Carlisle Barracks prior to the Civil War when they were still members of the United States Army. Oh. He paused in Carlisle while sending his cavalry under Brigadier General Elbert Jenkins towards the Susquehanna River and Harrisburg. After resting uh, much of his infantry overnight, he will move northward in his quest to seize the state capital. He's like, you can go mm -hmm. get Gettysburg. I'm going to the state capital, baby. Uh, yeah, that was Harrisburg, though. Still is. He won't it? make it. After the Confederates left in response to an order from Lee to concentrate near Gettysburg, Carlisle was reoccupied by Major General Baldy Smith of the Union and a small contingent of the New York and Pennsylvania militia from the Department of Susquehanna, dispatched by the Department Commander Major General Darius Couch. 32nd and 33rd Pennsylvania Volunteer Militia, Landis's Philadelphia Militia Artillery Battery, and a company of the 1st New York Cavalry formed Smith's Force there. Smith's, wow. Smith's, Smith's. Late afternoon, July 1st, 1863, Jeb Stewart led two brigades of cavalry at the end of their raid into Maryland and Pennsylvania. He did this to Carlisle to take a look for supplies and to attempt to assertion the whereabouts of Ewell's troops. <laughs> this dude just got to, Stuart's been wrong. <laughs> <laughs> just been everywhere. I've it, been through yeah, the right. east on a horse with no name. <laughs> a third brigade under Wade Hampton remained behind in York County to guard a train of 125 captured federal supply wagons. Instead of finding Ewell, Stewart encountered Smith's militiamen of the North. Mm. Despite having a large numerical advantage, Stewart's troops, who were too exhausted from a month in the campaign to attack the town outright, they're like, dude, we finally so found what we're looking for, and we don't know what to do with it. Shit. Uh, so Stewart initially feared that the enemy troops were, were veterans from the Army of the Potomac. He was like, mm. Well, after learning that Smith's men were only militia, Stewart sent Major General Fitzhugh Lee into Carlisle with a white flag telling Smith to either evacuate the town or to clear out the women and children. Smith replied that he had already done the latter and refused to surrender. So said, these women and children are gone. Let's have at it. He's like, what women and children? All right. Stewart's horse artillery under Captain James Brethed then began bombarding the town. After shelling Carlisle for several hours, Stewart received word that fighting had broken out to the southwest at Gettysburg between the main armies. He's oh, like, oh, no. shit. Unable to take the town by force, he disengaged. Having ordered his troops to set fire, set on fire the Carlisle by barracks. His troops started moving towards the fighting at Gettysburg about 1 a.m. on July 2nd, 1863. Oh, jeez. In addition to minimal Union and Confederate casualties, a lumber yard and the town gas works were destroyed after being set fire. What the hell's a gas work? Um, however, Stewart's delay at Carlisle impacted his ability to rendezvous with Lee's main army, though. Wow. Dude, Stewart has been just such a failure these right. last few weeks. Come on. Jeez, oh, Pete. <laughs> wow. Hook moves us to the first battle of Cabin Creek. 
took place. That's just totally separate from Gettysburg, too. Uh, whatever. Took place on the 1st of July through the 2nd of July, 1863, Mays County, Oklahoma, during the American Civil War, obviously. <laughs> the Confederate forces under Colonel Stan Wadey attempted a, an ambush on Union Supply Convoy led by Colonel James Monroe Williams. Colonel Williams had the charge of the escort of a uh, Union supply train from Fort Scott, Kansas to Fort Gibson, Oklahoma. Fort Scott! <laughs> Uh, which was then Indian Territory right. style. Ooh, his force marching along the Texas Road and consisted of detachments of the 2nd Colorado Infantry, 3rd Wisconsin Volunteer Cavalry, 6th uh, Regiment of the Kansas Volunteer Cavalry, the 9th Regiment of the Kansas, Kansas Volunteer Cavalry, 3rd Regiment of the Indian Home Guard, 1st Kansas Colored Infantry, and the 2nd Kansas Artillery. All right, look at them Kansans. <laughs> Confederate Colonel Stan Wadey had intended to ambush Williams' convoy and had 16 to 1,800 men lying in wait at the Cabin Creek crossing. Wadey had counted on 1,500 additional men led by Brigadier General William Cabell to strengthen his force prior to the attack, but his troops were delayed by high waters on the Grand River. Williams arrived at the crossing July 1st and learned of the intentions of Wadey's force from captured Confederate soldiers. Snitches. Snitches. Wadey's battle line extended around one mile either side of the crossing and trenches dug into the brush line in the creek. Damn. Uh, owing to the unusually high water level into the creek, which re reached above shoulder height, Williams chose to delay his attack on the Confederates until the following day and corralled his wagons defensively on a nearby prairie. Prairie. All right. What are they going to do? Right. Okay, there. So Williams ordered a half hour artillery bombardment before launching an assault with the 3rd Indian Home Guard. They failed to make it across to. <laughs> He's like, send the fucking Indians out there. <laughs> right. They failed to make it across the now waist deep creek. Wow, that went push, down a lot. Pushed back to heavy, uh, ooh, pushed back by heavy Confederate fire. And so the 9th Kansas Cavalry were ordered to charge on the covering of the 1st Kansas Colored Infantry. Oh, let you guys, let's send the colors out there. Be <laughs> the Indians and the colors, get out of there. <laughs> With the cavalry having gained a bridgehead across the creek, Williams led the men of his own regiment, the 1st Kansas Colored Infantry. Okay. At least he, right? Yeah. General Shaw and Ed up there, huh? <laughs> uh, in a headlong charge across the stream into the brush. This forced the Confederates back. Williams pursued them for a quarter of a mile as they attempted to rally in a clearing. Williams then led his convoy to successfully resupply Fort Gibson. He's like, we did oh, it. Look at that. I think there was like some kind of loud music I played. Maybe. Mm. I bet you they all celebrated that night. Round finished. Confederate <laughs> casualties amounted to 65 men killed, with the Union Army suffering between 3 Jeez. and 23 dead, with 30 wounded. Between 3 and 23 dead? <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> we don't know. Somewhere around there. Uh, the action made possible the continuation of a Union force in the Indian Territory, allowing the later victories at Honey Springs and Fort Smith, which we'll get to. Thank Soon you. after the battle, the Union established defensive outposts along the Texas Road, including one at the Crabbing Creek Crossing. The battle has the distinction of being the first time ever in which African-American soldiers fought alongside the whiteies. The old whites? Um, a monument to the 1st Kansas Colored Infantry was erected on the battlefield July 7th, 2007. Good for them. All right. All right. Good, Good for you. them. Three and twenty-three dead, though. I don't. That's got to be the weirdest, <laughs> weirdest dead I've ever seen. That's between zero and a thousand dead. Right. And I told you guys. Quick little one, about fifteen minutes. That's it. That's all it takes for these guys. Nothing really happening. No. On these ones, but next week, it's all going down. Meet me at Gettysburg. It's going down. You don't want to miss that. So you're about to have a force of at least 93,500 for the Union going up to about maybe as many as 80,000 against for the Confederates. 270 artillery pieces for the Confederates, 9,500 cavalry. 360 artillery pieces for the Union with 36 cavalry. What? 36 cavalry regiments. Regiments, so right. They have 9,500 all together. So they probably got two, three grand. Total casualties for each side, 23,000 for the Union, 23 to 28 for the freaking Confederates, dude. That is dumb. That's a quarter of their freaking force. Yep. And uh, the war has officially changed tides. Yeah. But that's it. It was the Battle of Donaldsonville, second Battle of Donaldsonville. No, it wasn't. It was the Battle of Sporting Hill, the Battle of Carlisle, and the Battle of Cabin Creek. Cabin Creek. And we shall be back next week for Gettysburg. And in the meantime, go check out our other podcast, Battles of the Outlaws and Gunslingers, <laughs> <laughs> where 
This week's episode is going to be the official start of the Genovese crime family. Don't know who's going to be on uh, at this moment, but somebody, obviously. So, yep, we're in the middle of the mafia. We're not even middle, just beginning them. we got a long ways to go over there, too, so we're getting good on both of these podcasts over here. Then we got uh, this weekend's winter. Only in Cornelius. Yeah. We'll be back for Gettysburg next week. We're the Mother Music Interviews.